And now I believe Trish will give us our service for today. Especially when Trish remembers to unmute. (laughs) (laughs) No, I would. So um, I love our community. We, uh, We laugh and love and live in connection with one another. And I was saying before I realized I was muted uh, that uh, our practitioners each week select the uh, readings according to what their heart calls them to do in connection with what's posted for the, uh, the message title. And so they do such a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. And so uh, with that, I'm going to duck over and start. Uh, if you were around last week, you uh, heard me or I made reference to a poet that I hadn't encountered before. And uh, I found a couple of other things. I think she's got a lot going for it. And this week, I'm going to share one with you that's called The Worst Thing I Ever Did. And it's actually more like the worst thing we ever did, because that starts off with, the worst thing we ever did was put God in the sky, out of reach, pulling the divinity from the leaf, sifting out the holy from our bones, insisting God isn't bursting dazzlement through everything. We've made a hard commitment to see as ordinary the stripping away or the stripping of sacred from everywhere, to put in a cloud man elsewhere, prying closeness from our heart. The worst thing we ever did was take the dance and song out of prayer. We made it sit up straight and cross its legs. Removed it, uh, removed it from uh, rejoicing, wiped clean of its hips sway, its questions, its ecstatic yowl, its tears. The worst thing we ever did was pretend God isn't the easiest thing in the universe, available to every soul in every breath. Hmm. I think she's got something there. When we act like God is somehow separate from us or that there is a rigidity, we have so missed the point. It is just amazing how skewed we've become. A guy by the name of McGilchrist declared, the model we choose to use to understand something determines what we find. And by the way, that gets really far, can get really far into um, quantum physics because the, the observer controls a lot of what is then available. But I'm not going to go there. I'm going to stick on the topic, which is the one and only. I'm going to resist the temptation to go off the other direction. And so my question to you, and we're going to come back to it in lots of different ways, is what model are you seeking to fill? Is it a God that is only outside of you? A God that's uh, up in the sky, like in Shalon's uh, poem? Is it a God uh, that is, uh, has created everyone as wonderful, except perhaps for by you? Is it a God as whatever? Or is it a God that is everything, that is showing up as everything? Is that kind of leans toward the Hindu monist theology, but in our way of looking at the world, We see that God, or whatever you want to call it, has sprung forth into an as all of creation. So, according to Dr. Holmes, the only God a man knows is the God of his own inner life. He can know no other. To assume that man can know a God outside himself is to assume that he can know something of which he cannot be conscious. That's quite a mouthful. 
Okay. It kind of sums down to who or what is the God of your understanding? Because the God of your understanding is the result of how you are looking at and for God. It's a matter of what you seek, where you put your attention. And so I like to drop back to, you know, let's just get it straight. Get it that there, that our teaching is actually the intersection of science and spirituality because we understand, and last week I went into more about this, but uh, we understand that it has sprung forth of itself and that it is all of it. It is the science aspect. And because we believe it was a conscious choice to spring into and as all of creation, we are on the side of the spirit. So, there is no God that is just outside. The God that is outside is the God that is inside. There is only one God. There is only one life. That life is the life of God and therefore our lives. There is no dualism here. There isn't some, uh, there isn't, uh, gee whiz, will the God out there please swoop down and fix me here? Instead, it is the God that of my understanding, the God of my understanding is one that is equally present everywhere. And so all relationships, all everything is the engagement of the spirit and spirit. So that comes down to that matter of choice. That matter of choice is, do you choose a discordant or a harmonious relationship with spirit? Now, when I say a relationship with spirit, a lot of people say, oh, well, when I'm in prayer, everything's harmonious. Now, we are in relationship with spirit all the time. Since you're made of God's stuff and I'm made of God's stuff, all relationship is God's stuff or spirit in relation with itself. Expressing as me, expressing as you, expressing as anybody and everybody else. So all of relationship is God relating to and with itself. So here's one I was really pleased with when I realized it. So we get to participate consciously. We get to welcome awe and wonder or we can participate unconsciously and reap collective unconsciousness. Now, often I have encountered the term collective consciousness. And when I was preparing for this, I realized that's not a right statement. At least it's not a right statement for me because it is not collective consciousness is in uplifted awareness and awakeness and harmony and all of the things that we attribute to a higher consciousness. It is, in fact, collective unconsciousness. Think about the times when maybe somebody hurt your feelings. They didn't, um, I, I'll have, okay, I doubt they did it deliberately. Most people do not hurt other people's feelings intentionally. Most people hurt other pe uh, people's feelings unconsciously, thoughtlessly, without thought, without caring, without actually being conscious there. So this, con this idea, this thought that occurred to me about our biggest challenge, of course, is that we are swimming in collective unconscious. And so Rumi, being one of my favorites, declared, your task is not to seek love, but merely to seek and find all barriers within yourself that, have, that you have built against it. Well, I want to shift that a little, paraphrase him a little. Your task is not to seek consciousness or to seek oneness, but merely to seek and find 
all of the barriers within yourself that you have built against it and remove them. Hmm. It's that choice thing and it's up to us. We get to wake up to it. We get to notice and remove those obstacles that we have put in place. Now, I made re reference to Hindu monism. Uh, in the Hindu tradition, they believe that God, the, the God uh, of their understanding and their naming, uh, has come forth as all of creation. And so that's why I lean very much in their direction. And so when talking about divinity, that awakening to the, the divinity within each of us, within all of life, uh, there's a story about uh, with Brahma, ultimate God, saying, we, uh, you know, the, the gods have come to him and said, well, where, where can we put this that somebody won't damage it? Where will somebody put divinity that somebody won't damage it? And uh, Brahma said, so where are you, what are you going to do with it? And they said, well, we'll hide it. We'll hide it in the mountain. We'll dig a hole. And Brahma said, mm, somebody's going to come along and dig it up. And well, we'll put it in the deepest ocean. Mm, nah, somebody's going to dive down and find it. We'll put it on the top of the mountain. They won't be able to climb. Yeah, sometime, somehow they'll get to the top of the mountain. And so finally they came to, we will hide their divinity deep in the center of their own beings. Humans will search for it here and there, but they won't look for the divinity inside their true selves. All the gods agreed that this was the perfect hiding place. And the deed was done. And since then, humans have been going up and down the earth, digging, diving, climbing, exploring, searching for something which already lies within themselves. Our divinity, that is the God spark that is equal, equally present everywhere, is in us, as us. That's what Rumi is talking about us going and discovering the barriers that are between us and our realization, our awareness that we are divine beings, we are one with, inseparable from that creator. And so we are inseparable from one another because we are each individuations of that creator. And so it drops back to that model. What model do we choose for the world? It's a matter of distinctions and decisions about those distinctions and the models and the labels that we use. Do we call things sacred, mundane, or profane? Do we call them holy, unholy, or non-holy? Since God is equally present everywhere, how, are, how do we make those distinctions? And then bringing in the power of our word, the power of our thought. What we declare is our experience of them. Just like when we focus on something, it becomes our life. That expands into it. So how are we using that power of thought and law? Are we honoring the sacred? Are we celebrating the holy? Or are we are we um, demeaning it? Are we putting it down? Are we saying that it is less than or even bad? So what is the model that we are filling? Our model is how we perceive the world. When we make reference to spirituality, we we are talking about a constructive atmosphere of goodness, truth, beauty, harmony, all of those wonderful attributes, set in such an atmosphere, all can thrive. So it's important to listen to how we are describing our universe, how we are describing the God of our, un of our understanding, and how we are describing its expression. 
when we condemn, we are casting, we are using the power of our word in a negative way. We are using it to make less than of what it is. Instead of honoring the sacredness, honoring the holiness of all that is. And so the that atmosphere of spirituality comes to us as we invite it in. So again, what model are you desiring to fill? What mold are you using to create your experiences? Are you truly open to God as all? Are you realizing the complete unity of life? of God, of creation. And remember that the same intelligence that created the stars, galaxies, planets, also created all this planet and all of its inhabitants. Many, uh, many humans arrogantly declare that animals lack the ability to think that they cannot reason. And I, oh, that is so not so. And so it's important to examine our beliefs. It's important to look at maybe the obstacles or barriers that we've built. It's important for us to look at the models we use to perceive our world. So I ask you, what are your assumptions? What are your assumptions about the fellow inhabitants of this planet? I'm going to tell just a little side story because um, I guess it's relevant. Um, back before I came into this wor world of forum, um, I had a brother. And that brother, I mean, my mother was just fine being the parent of an only child. My father was not. Uh, he had been an only child, and he thought that was a horrible thing to not have a sibling. And so um, anyway, I came along. And when I arrived, my father had envisioned a girly girl. And so he had all these hopes, and he had all these frilly things in mind. And I was a really big disappointment. Um, I don't think I should say it quite that way. I wasn't the girl he was expecting, put it that way. I was fascinated with life from when I was first um, first on the scene. Um, my mother has a story of me as a time, really quite small infant being put on a, a window bench uh, where I could look out. And she said that... Uh, she could watch me watching the birds and the butterflies and anything that came by that window to the total uh, elimination of she would I wouldn't notice if a human came into the room. I was totally fixated on whatever was out there. All living things. I was fascinated with life. I had two, and as I started growing, I had two fast uh, two fixations actually. Um, the one was very definitely God. And I asked all kinds of questions about God, which was kind of awkward in a household where I was being raised by an agnostic that leaned toward uh, atheism and an agnostic that kind of, well, she actually liked the traditions of church. I don't think she... I Anyway, so it was a little awkward to have a kid that was constantly asking about God. Well, my second, my second fixation, maybe my first actually, was about life and all of the critters. I love the creepy crawlies, the snakes, the rescue animals, you name it. I was really into them and learning about them and learning from them, and learning how they could be patient, and learning all this from them. I, you know, I loved the, our pet dog, not because she was a dog. It was because she was alive, and she had things to teach me. And so, as, um, as I look back, there is a part of me that 
senses that I saw God as all of those. I knew that their divinity was right there and they didn't have funny barriers and funny stories to keep it from showing. There was a compassion and an empathy. I could feel with them. I could trust them to be authentic. In many cases, they were better company than the humans. But an interesting wraparound on this is oddly my mother, who um, a write-off wasn't real thrilled with having me around, that was our bond. That was our common ground. Because when she saw me come alive with awareness of the divinity of all creation, she let it be known that she could see. She knew they knew. She knew that those critters knew a whole lot more than most people give them credit. And so I invite you to look at how you look at the other inhabitants of this planet, of any planet. I invite you to look at whether that model, you know, because we each use a model. We, the model we choose to use to understand something controls what we find. That's a piece of, of quantum physics for sure. But what model are you using? Are you using a model that says, yes, I see the divinity in the snake and the tree. I see the divinity in the chipmunk that's stealing the bird feed. I see the divinity of the leaf. And like in Shalon's poem, we don't want to let others steal the oh, steal the holiness away or hide it away. We want it to come out. And so what this kind of comes down to is, yup, I am an ab absolutist. God is all there is. And that perspective works for me. How about you? How about you? Is the model you have working for you? You can answer a question. I've got a couple of other questions I might ask if you're brave enough to answer that one. Like, for instance, what does it mean to honor the divinity of all creation? Anybody going to dive in? Mm. Nobody br brave this morning? Maybe I need to try looking for volunteers. Sure. So um all right, tell, say the question again so everyone's clear on the question. If what does it mean to you to honor the the divinity of all creation? So for me to honor the divinity of all creation means that you accept everyone for who and what they are. And you there's no judgment, and uh, sometimes that's really challenging. Uh, but that's uh, that's my goal, and uh, to let people fully express who and what they are, and know that everyone deserves love, no matter what, and, and they are love, and um, that that's it for me. Thank you. Anybody else? We might quiet. I, I would like to go. Please do. And we might want to share the screen so so yeah. Facebook can see who's talking. Yeah, um, I, I am faceless right now. But this is Gail. And um, I really, really, really am enjoying this topic. Um, you know, this 
you know, what model am I using to see God? How do I see God? How do I see spirit? How do I see the all there is? And how, you know, what does it mean to me? Well, I have been thrown back as a result of your talk today, back into my Christian faith, actually, where I am sensing absolute gratitude, absolute worship, absolute idea of whoa, my eyes are opened anew to the allness of who I am, but who, who everything else, everyone else, every idea of, of existence is. And that puts me into a space of um, awesome, A-W-E, some feeling. I am in such such a space this morning. I'm so grateful to come back to that space and to know I can freely worship. I can worship with the idea that God is, and God is magnificent. And if I can't recognize that magnificent, then what is my worship about? That's who I am. Thank you, Reverend Trish. Thank you, dear Gail. So beautiful. So oh, absolutely beautiful. So anybody else? I on uh, as I've been I have a young dog, so I take her for a lot of walks. And on those walks lately, I've been contemplating a lot of the frustration that I'm feeling <clears throat> not being able to even put myself in someone else's shoes who can't, who judges people because of the color of their skin or because they're too tall or too fat or too, too thin or too something that there's mm -hmm. something other about them. And listening to you today, um, what I know is I need to find that space where I see that, the, that, that person or people who I get frustrated with, I need to see that divinity also. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, frankly, it's real easy to love mm -hmm. uh, the, the dog and honor the dog's mm -hmm. divinity yes. and question the divinity of some other inhabitants that happen mm -hmm. to be two-legged. Well, I also <laughs> have to start, you know, Bring, and then I do this frequently, bring back to the point of seeing her divinity when she's barking like crazy because people decide to stand outside of my house and talk. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, I can go. Yeah. Kathy, you unmuted. Yes. Um, one of the ways I'm honoring God now is through loving myself because God doesn't make junk. Amen. He doesn't make mistakes. Um, and I'm here right now for a purpose, but um, also loving the other, you know, the, what people consider the other, but um, I think that's a big way I can honor God. Oh, you brought up uh, such a really important piece of it, and that is uh, we must begin with loving ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then we love others from our overflow. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of us that um, whatever the whatever the history may be, is we know we can change how we are in the life. I mean, whatever that history may be, we may have gone through a time of looking in a mirror. And I speak for myself. I could mm -hmm. see the divinity of all of the people in my life even the ones I didn't like, I definitely could see the divinity in all my critters and all mm -hmm. the animals I rescued and all these other things. But when I looked in that mirror, I thought, I see the divinity in everyone except. Mm -hmm. And uh, getting past that and seeing and knowing the divinity of each of us, ourselves, then we love from that overflow of love. Then we care from that overflow. 
Thank you for bringing that up, Kathy. Mm -hmm. My name is Francois, and uh, I'm so good to be glad to be here. Uh, normally, I have an awful lot of love for others, for myself, and uh, however, <laughs> Saturday, I went to a dance, and I prepared myself to by asking the women at the coffee bar if they would dance one dance with me. Because I didn't want to get that feeling of loneliness and isolation, hurt, you know. So I thought I had it all set up. And in fact, uh, when the dance started, I uh, uh, danced with three different women multiple times each one. You know, I, I throw in a lot of disco twists and turns and stuff like that. So we were laughing the whole time, you know. And... Uh, and then this one from Guatemala just was so filled with laughter, just like my Brazilian girlfriend Leah was. Uh, she had to go. So I asked one of the women that I thought I had it set up, you know, at the coffee bar. And she said, well, it's really not my kind of music. Now, that's not a no. That's <laughs> like kind of wait, you know, until we get my kind of music. Mm -hmm. uh, boy, did I take that badly. I just left, you know, hmm. 45 minutes into the dance, I left feeling really pretty messed up inside, you know, and, uh, and then in the morning, I tried to get sympathy from my friend Vince and, and from a Marine that lives two doors up the house, you know, two doors up from me and uh, him and his wife, Alice, and they said, Frank, you danced for 45 minutes with three different women. Y'all laughed and had a good time. What are you complaining about? I didn't get any sympathy at all. Gee whiz. <laughs> so I guess I'm more or less fixed now. <laughs> but <laughs> more or less. Anyway, thank you. And so that sort of leads into uh, uh, how would you describe your relationship with God over the years? Yep. Um, when you honor the God in you and the uh, the God in then the God in others, then um, okay, that relationship is uh, is probably transformed through the years. Mm. So. And the God in dance. Yes. Well, in um, a Shalon's poem that I read, um, uh, I love the uh, part about, and it's in fine print here, uh, the worst thing, uh, the wor second of the worst things. The worst thing we ever did was take the dance and song out of prayer made it sit up straight and cross its legs, removed it, uh, it from rejoicing, wiped clean mm. of its hips, um, mm. of its hip sway, its questions, its ecstatic yowl and tears. And so, yeah, we don't want to wipe clean that. We want to celebrate it and dance and express and honor the divinity of all. So since we sort of ran out of responses, let's pray. <laughs> so let's just go to that space. Let's just go to that space that honors the divinity of all. And when thinking of a model that we, that we are filling, think of it as a mold for holding and forming and I will invite you to envision cracking that mold wide open. Absolutely cracking that mold wide open. Feel your body expand. Feel your thought processes expand. 
And so as I know there is only one God, one creator, one source that has sprung forth into an as all of creation, I know the truth of myself is that I am one with, I am an individuation of that. And what is true of me is true of everyone, everywhere, absolutely, and everything, everywhere. All of the critters, all of, all of, all of it. And so I now declare that each of us today is shattering any old mold, any old model that kept us constrained so that we have now the freedom to expand, to let our spirituality show, to be out there and greeting in awe and wonder all of God's creation, whether it's seeing it in a leaf or a bug or a person or a giant mountain or the expanse of the ocean, it doesn't, wherever we're seeing it, maybe a few raindrops, seeing the divinity of it all. And as I breathe into this, affirming this on behalf of each and every one of us, it is gratitude that arises within me. Gratitude spilling over and contaging all that are in, in reach of my voice. This, this, this. This is how it is to be conscious in a world of consciousness, to be an awakening force within that consciousness. And so gratitude abounds. I know that the words I have spoken are true, are the truth. So I release them and I invite you to say with me, and so it is.